Welcome back to Judgment and Decision Making. My name is Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to talk about the law of small numbers. And this begins with a very simple question. Do you think that you are a good intuitive statistician? When you see statistics or you experience likelihood in your life, do you think you're good at understanding it and making decisions with it? Well, let's see in some examples here. In this scenario, it says the counties in which the incidence of kidney cancer is lowest are mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and West. Why do rural areas have lower cancer risk? I'm sure we can come up with a lot of explanations for why these places could have lower cancer risk including that they have a rural lifestyle, there's clean air, clean water, good food and exercise, right? Sounds like a wonderful place to live, these rural areas. Let's look at another scenario, though. Uh, in counties in which incidents of can kidney cancer are the highest, are mostly rural, sparsely populated, located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, South, and West. So then why do rural areas have greater cancer risk in this example? Well, maybe it's due to poverty, lack of medical care, high fat diet, alcohol, or tobacco. Now, the problem here that I'm sure you can see is we were able to, in our mind, generate reasons why rural areas might have lower cancer risk or higher cancer risk. That made a lot of sense, right? It's intuitive that they could either have both. Well, there's statistics that suggest they do have the highest and lowest. So why could that be? It can't be described by the same lifestyle. These people in uh, rural areas have the same type of lifestyle. Well, it's because there's smaller population. When there's a smaller population, the population can be more variable because there's less people to even out the differences. There's just happens to be people that have higher cancer risk in some small areas and also lower in some small areas, but the population isn't big enough to even that out. Let me show you another example that might help you kind of understand what I'm talking about with this random sampling. Okay, yes, this populations are more variable, smaller populations are more variable. Okay, this is something I care deeply about, which is student evaluations. Every semester, at the end of every semester, you are asked to submit student evaluations. And in this hypothetical example, five students submitted evaluations, and most of them gave me very high scores, but one student gave me a zero. So my average score is a 6.8, which is okay, but not very good for a particular class. Now let's imagine that we removed that one student, student five, that they forgot to submit their student evaluation. Well, my score now is an 8.5. So is my class good or bad? It could look like it was a so-so class if it just happened to have that one student that didn't like it submit their score. And it can look like a great class if I just happened to have only students that liked the class submit their scores. That this only works when you have a few number of people submitting the evaluations. If we look, oh yes, and this is a 20% reduction by just taking away one person. Now if we look at this other example where we have 30 students submitting their scores. In this case, we had two students that submitted zeros. They hated the class, maybe they got a bad grade on their final, and they just hate the class for some reason. But most people really loved the class. And so it's probably a pretty great class, except for those two people that, for whatever reason, didn't like it. Now, in this case, my average score would be an 8.4 in the class. And if we remove those two students, say they forgot to submit their evaluations, the score just goes up by one, uh, by 0.1 points. So there's a less of an influence of those two people that gave zeros when there's more people submitting their score. It says when the population is larger, these outliers, meaning these people that are very different 
from the average or the kind of the true nature of the of the data, they have less of an impact on the overall mean of the evaluation. But what I'm really trying to point out to you is that these smaller populations, which just generally means smaller groups of things, um, are more variable. So it's important to one, submit your student evaluations at the end of a course, just so that people who are very different from the average don't really bring a professor's score down. Our ability to get tenure, which is um, our ability to stay in our job long term, is dependent on these student evaluations. So it's very important that you submit your student evaluations, even if you were so-so about the class, please submit those evaluations to get the population higher. And also just note that anytime you have a small bit of information, it might be highly biased by randomness, random variability. So if you want to get more uh, accurate data, you need to collect more samples. It's highly important to get as large of a sample size as possible. Okay, so this relates to this concept of the bias of, of confidence over doubt. And this happens in psychology that was um, part of the reason for the replication crisis. And what the replication crisis is, um, I've actually talked about it a little bit in a, in a previous video, but the replication crisis is that some of the original early studies in psychology, people tried to recreate those studies and they were not able to find the same results. Part of that is because the original studies were done with small groups of people and their results were based on the few people that happened to to um, have the result they were looking for. And when the studies were repeated with large groups of people, they didn't find that effect. And so um, this is the, the common belief that psychologists commonly choose uh, samples so small that they expose themselves to 50% risk of failing to confirm their true hypothesis. That's why it's very, very important when you start engaging in research to do a sample size calculation meaning that you calculate the number of people you need to test to ensure that you can find a reliable effect. So this is um, kind of illustrated in our, our inability to think of random information as truly random. For example, if you see something like this where you have four boys born in a row, what do you think is the most likely um, gender of the baby to be born. Most people would say a girl. You know, there's four boys born at a hospital, let's say, probably is gonna be a girl, right? Because the population is around 50-50. But a baby born to different mothers, <laughs> there's no relationship in probability. These are just different women that happen to have boys. So there is a 50-50 shot that the next baby will be a boy or a girl because the previous probabilities do not affect the probability of an individual woman giving birth at that time. It's like a coin flip. If I were to flip a coin and get heads 10 times in a row, it might seem like I should get tails. But the probability of getting tails at any one coin flip is 50-50. It is an independent event, not related to the, the previous events. If I were to flip that coin a hundred or a thousand times, you would start to see a 50-50 split. But the probability of each flip is a 50-50 chance, heads or tails. Okay, and this is an interesting um, example of this, which is in sports, the hot hand. Many of you might have heard of this concept. It's a general idea that um, players might get on a winning streak. And because they have a hot hand, maybe they've made four shots in a row, they're likely to make the fifth. And what researchers found is that because of random probability, the, it is uh, potentially likely that someone might make three, four, five, six shots in a row because they're making so many shots. If you think about it, in the NBA, how many shots are made a game? I don't know. Let's say 100. And how many games are played a year? 
So it is definitely within normal probability for four or five of those shots to just go in from pure random chance. And um, the, the issue is that there's a lot of pushback to this because it feels like a player is going on a winning streak, but really it's explained by random probability. Okay, summary here. Are we good intuitive statisticians? No, we're not, unfortunately. There's a bias of confidence over doubt where we are confident with insufficient information. When we have a small bit of information, we just have a tendency to believe that it applies to the entire world, to the entire population. But it, that small amount of information can be highly biased based on sampling. And the law of small numbers is that people tend to extrapolate too quickly from a small sample to the whole population. Mm -hmm.